Um, Ian was saying that he wanted to thank everyone for giving him dead lost. And what, what's the same is, is both Ian and I are on the steering committee. I think we're taking one for the team. Um, so I want to thank everyone for, for being here. I know you guys are tired. I know you guys have conference fatigue. So what I want to talk about, quite simply, is a mystery. Now, one of the great things about doing what I do is that periodically, I get to, I get to play Sherlock Holmes. We get posed questions as, as ecologists that ultimately help management. And Pete, whether he'd be grumpy or not, posed a question to Olivier Bonnet and myself and asked this very simple question. Why are some of the white rhino coughs dying in the Atolla Game Reserve? All right? Unlike apparently previous studies or <clears throat> the previous talks, I'm incredibly fortunate. We have amazing, amazing data to answer this question. And thank you for Atolla for doing this. Let's set the stage. 51 coughs were born between 1999 and 2010. This is a good birth rate, so we're doing well in white rhinos and Atolla. Problem is 15 of them have died. What does this actually work out to? This is a survival rate of 70%. Is this important? Is this a big deal? Well, if you take a look at some of the white rhino um, data, when you take a look at um, Shishuli and Falozi, <coughs> Norman found about an 8% mortality in youngsters in between 0 and 1. Here, Maybe it's a bit more. We are going to experience natural mortality. There's going to be natural mortality in individuals when they're young. Large herbivores, mega herbivores like rhinos, elephants, one of the greatest portions of mortality is right after birth. They're dependent on their mothers for food, protection. This is also where uh, drought and disease can affect them. Okay? Well, when we take a look at this a bit more closely, we see that all of this death has taken place in the dry season. Alarm bells go off. Pete wants to know, what's going on here? Do we have a problem? So, they pose this question. Do we have too many rhinos? This is one of the key aspects of Atala. We need to maintain these rhinos. Do we have too many? Ultimately, are we, in essence, seeing density-dependent mortality? This is the question that's posed. And the nice thing is, we have the data to look at it. Let's just take a look at a couple things here. This is the, the monthly rainfall here on the y-axis. It's represented by the blue line. Okay, the bars are the number of deaths on the far side here, months of the year from January through to December. And what you can see is that mortality follows this dry season. However, you probably also noticed, <laughs> Adrian, um, October, November is not the dry season. But if we take a look at the rainfall, this is what we find. This is 2008. You can see a very dry year, as Pete was referring to. All of a sudden, we get a dry season that kicks in here. We've got, we've got May, June, July, August, September, October. The rains come late in November. We've got two rhino deaths. Right? What about the early thing? Because what we're seeing is predominantly death at the end of the dry season. This is the crunch time. Food resources are at their lowest. Body condition is at their lowest. What about the early? Because, hey, June, July is the start of it. Well, let's take a look at 2002. Once again, the dry season starts in March. Okay? March, April, May, by June, July, August these coughs are dying. All right. So what we're seeing is rainfall seems to be playing a role. What are the age of these coughs? What are these individuals that are dying? Well, we take a look. We have the number of coughs that have died here, their ages and months. We see that predominantly it's coming in roughly about four or five, years, five months of age, all the way up to um, 10 to 11 are really the key areas. But what about these individuals way at the far end? Well, these guys are dying in their second winter. So they're faced with a situation where they hit low rainfall and they actually die. But one of the things that stands out, and all of you should be seeing this, look at this. No mortality. This is the key period where coughs should be dying. But what we're seeing is from zero, or from zero to three months, you're A-OK. -okay, okay? After that, problems kick in. And we'll get into answering exactly what that is. Okay, so I talked about this amazing data. At Tyler, we're looking at about 40 white rhinos. I don't know the latest figures, but we've got about 40 white rhinos. They're all known. They're all notched. They get fantastic data that comes in. They know where they are. They get monthly sighting data. All this is put into this fantastic database. Thank you very much, guys. What this has allowed us to do, if you were here for Robin's talk, this allowed us to generate the territorial ideas. We've got Lisa Hibbelman, who's finishing up her corrections now, was able to generate home ranges. We can generate the mother's home ranges. We can then overlay them on, once again, you're talking about 1974, Shishlui's uh, um, vegetation, 2008. Von Royen does, does a vegetation map for the reserve. We've got good quality habitat data, good sighting data, and what we could then do is overlay these home ranges 
and work out the proportion of these different habitats that are found within these home ranges. Okay? And this will become important. Finally, we have 12 years worth of breeding success. We know when individuals are approximately born, and we know when they disappear. Okay? Because individuals are seen on a regular basis. This is fantastic, fantastic data to work with. All right? So what are the variables we put into the statistical model? We want to know what's driving mortality. Well, the first thing we looked at was cough sex. Key thing you may find is that males demand more than females. You see this with elephants. They suckle more. They require more resources. Maybe it's, it's the youngsters that are dying. Maybe they're males. Maybe they're females. We also take a look at age of the mother. Well, we don't know exactly how old each individual is. <laughs> but what we do know is that over the 12 years, at the, 12, at the start of it, okay, 12 years later, those individuals are... 12 years older, right? Okay? So we can work this out. So we can see younger mothers compared to older mothers. And how does this affect survival of their coughs? And we also can know the total white white on density. So we can get an idea of density within the park at that certain time. And ultimately, this leads to competition. So how does this affect survival? Okay? So these are the, these are the rhino variables. What can we look at um, environmentally? Well, we take a look at rainfall. This is where Pete comes in. I've got some good news for you, Pete. We can show some stuff. Wet season rainfall, okay? Wet season rainfall is important. This will basically determine the amount of grass that grows up. This is the amount of food that will then transfer into the dry season. So we can get some ideas of that. Dry season rainfall, key, key variable. This determines how severe a dry season is. If you have a lot of rain during the dry season, this means that grass remains greener longer. This means that that crunch time right before the rains is short. Okay? Animals are in decent condition, quality remains high, availability remains high, and food's available. If you have very low dry season rainfall, this drops in, you have a reduction in quality of food, it's not growing, you're getting utilization, both availability and quality drop off, and you get a longer, more critical time period to that crunch time becomes important and more severe. Because we could generate the home ranges, we can work out proportion of woodlands. Why woodlands? Well, let's take a look at how white rhinos utilize habitats. They start off in the summer, they're using grazing lawns, short grass areas. As the dry season progresses, it kicks in, we see them shift into woodlands. Microhabitats, it's high, it's basically nice moist areas, <coughs> grass remains greener longer. You also have fantastic food in there. Panica maxim, for example, if you want to be a herbivore or a grazer, I'd recommend that. Um, you've got really good quality stuff that's sitting there, okay? Then you'll see they'll move into the thermitas as the dry season progresses, but this is a key resource for them. The other one we looked at, because Olivier absolutely loves grazing lawns, but it does play a key role, is the fact that this is a very vital <coughs> resource for them come the wet season. During this time period, you've got high quality food that sits within it, okay? This may be a situation where they can go along and bulk up be in really good condition, they hit that dry season, and they're ready. They can handle it. Okay? So this is the variables that we looked at. <coughs> so we ran the model, and what did we get? No rhino variable makes any difference whatsoever. Okay? Sure. Of the rhino variables, well, that's none. Of these variables, the two that stand out, dry season is the number one important. Dry season rainfall is the key, followed by the proportion of woodlands. Let's take a look at the woodland first, because I think that we'll, it's, it's more dramatic to deal with uh, the rain season after that. So, if we take a look, as a female's home range, as the proportion of woodland within her home range goes from 20% up to greater percent, survival of her coughs goes from 14% to 75%. You know the old adage about buying property? Location, location, location. <laughs> this is about, if you are in a good habitat, you have a good home range, you're in a good location, your coughs are going to survive. Okay? If you're in marginal areas, or if you have low, they have a lower chance of survival. Okay? So this is a key thing there. Let's take a look at dry season rainfall. All right? So this is survival, zero, you're dead, one, fully alive. Right? So <laughs> this, is, this is a proportion of the population that's alive. This is the accumulative dry season rainfall. This is the dry season variable we used. What you can see is when it's low, we have a um, little bit of rainfall. We get a mix of survival. Okay? As you fit the curve, as you go up high, you get higher survival. What we see is basically here at about 70 millimeters of rain, dry season rainfall, you get a cutoff. If you were born such that your first dry season that you encounter has less than 70 millimeters of, of rainfall, you have a 41% chance of survival. Less than a coin toss. 
okay? You're less than 50%. However, if you're born such that you face that dry season with greater 70, 97%. Almost 100% survival. It's on a knife edge for these rhinos. It's all about the luck of the draw when you were born, okay? And this is what we're seeing here. 41% versus 97%. This is big stuff, okay? So, what does this mean ultimately for these guys? All right? It's ultimately for them, the critical age is between five to 10 months. All right? These individuals that are sitting here, five to 10 months, they hit that dry season, <laughs> they're sitting there, and you've got less than 70 uh, mils of rain, you have that low chance of survival. Why? Well, the key thing about these guys, they're basically in that point where they're weaned. The majority of their food is grass. It's not milk. These guys are on a pure milk diet. Mother is big. She has a large body. We know about mass-specific metabolic requirements. As your body gets larger, you have lower uh, metabolic requirements. You can survive off lower quality food. What we know of rhinos, however, is they have a fast throughput, so they still need high quality. But <coughs> these guys, despite the fact that rhinos get really big, they're small. They're a small-bodied animal sitting between five to ten months, and ultimately then, they have to have high-quality food. We see the same thing in these guys in their second winter. They have no milk in their diet. If there's low food quality, they sickle and they die. Okay? So what we're seeing is that it's a relationship between dry season rainfall driving mortality. Okay. So... What does this mean? Is this density dependence? Does a taller have too many white rhino? Is this all about too many white rhino? And the answer is no. Okay? We're not seeing a situation where every single year, every single dry season, we're seeing mortality. Okay? We are seeing some kicking in. And what we're actually viewing here, as Sherlock Holmes said, elementary idea, Watson, is natural population regulation. How are mega herbivores regulated? in these areas? And this is a great question. Elephant debate, we've sat through this. Rhino debate, how, what happens? What used, to, what used to regulate the population? On a small scale, it's dispersal. Individuals will pack up their bags, leave, and never come back. All right? On a large scale, it's drought and disease. Okay? It's not nice. Anthrax runs through your population, indiscriminately kills, kills individuals. I said, let it run. It's fantastic. It's a natural population regulation. What we're seeing here is this dry season rainfall is limiting these populations in really hectic years. So this is kind of an environmental carrying capacity which you've got, but the majority are not affected. So what we're seeing is a fantastic example of natural population regulation of white rhinos within this pot. And the individuals that are hit are these cocks. Thanks very much. One of the biggest differences, and I'm trying to link this paper with Eta and Chris's, one of the biggest differences between a Tala Game Reserve on one side and Kuzi and Shushui and Pelosi on the other is the topographic differences. Okay, no. Yeah, you're right, 100%. Now, um, Peter was talking about fencing off on the south bank of the Pongola River and the Tala. You do that, you immediately eliminate all those bottom lands, floodplain areas for which these animals are dependent to maintain that um, success with the, with the breathing, particularly during those crunch times. Mm -hmm. It's, so it's a, yeah, no, it's, just, it's that eastern population, and, and you guys are well aware of it. You have fantastic high density of white rhino in that, that eastern section, and you're right. It's, it's that, um, that area that they're using. I don't know to what degree, um, I haven't looked into the, the water availability throughout the park, but it is quite extensive. Everywhere. So everywhere. It's everywhere. So the thing is, is that in some cases, but... No, no, yeah, the thing is, you don't, want to, you don't want to block that off, you're right. But there is water available, and that's why we see these guys in the What's going to happen for the rhinos if that's the priority for Etana? <coughs> range expansion. That's the answer. Oh, Extending yeah. the reserve northwards. Yeah. Okay, two questions. The one's a science question, the other one's a management question. Um, did you look at all at temperature? Because uh, they also 
susceptible to cold temperatures, mm -hmm. both directly, but then also uh, there have been some late frosts. Mm -hmm. The late frost may really <coughs> nail the first grass flush. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter what the rain has been in the sense it's going to delay the end of the dry season from a grass perspective. So that's the first question. And the second one is, in terms of management, what you're saying is if you put out the CERN, well, the rhino will survive and you're going to grow more. <laughs> no, 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 I am not saying that, Rob. <laughs> if you would like to tie your name to that comment, you're more than welcome to. I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm just giving you an example of a mechanism. We're finally starting to understand no, no. the mechanism. I know, I know you're teasing. Uh, so, um, and the the follow-up question maybe for the, the frost one is um, the higher lands towards the southwest whether that's maybe where you see more of these mortalities or those your marginal habitats the, 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 the southwestern section, yeah, they're pretty much scattered across the park, the, the mortalities. And the frost we haven't looked at, it's a really good idea. Um, what we've seen that, that generally for, for large herbivores, that frost is really important if it comes right at, the, right at the end of it. You know, it's like Norman's work of when it snows in Joburg at the end of the dry season, you get dead kudu and Kruger, and, that's, and this is the idea. How much this will affect these guys, I don't know. Look, you may, you're going to again find the coughs will, will sickle the most, and that may drive it, um, but we haven't looked at it. But yeah, that's something I'll get, I'll get to Olivier to, to add into the model and see what we can get. Sure. Just two points. First of all, Itale is, oh, its extension is going to become part of the Black Iron Range expansion project. So I hope we can achieve something there. <laughs> secondly, um, secondly uh, it, it's quite interesting. There's five to six month age is the age when maternal immunity declines in, in uh, herbivores generally. Okay. And uh, I wonder whether you've looked at parasite loads in the calves that have died to see whether there was depressed immunity uh, I, a big factor. I, I don't think, no, no. See, we, we, we're piggybacking on this on this data set, so no, we haven't. Look, there's, there's a lot of stuff that comes in, we're, it's, but I think the what we're finding is this, you know, rainfall is going to drive that food. And that's the key thing. You get a lot of rain, good rains, you get good food. I mean, any farmer will tell you that. But the, the parasites <laughs> can definitely play a role here. Roger? Is there a possibility that, that, that this is unnatural population regulation and that we've changed the way in which we burn you know, our nature reserves? And so we've actually made it a lot more uniform, um, both in time and space. And if we encouraged um, less uniform 